Welcome to Geek History Lesson Live. I'm Jason, now live Inman. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming out to Usually the Podcast, where we take you through characters and constructs and all kinds of different things. Not in a theater, usually in our office. Yes. Uh, fun fact, originally when we first started Geek History Lesson, we recorded in a closet. So you heard the podcast in a closet. Yeah, we had a huge closet that yeah. had a lot of clothes in it. Yeah. Uh, so we recorded in there. It would get very hot. During the live show, you may see me putting up shirts around the <laughs> edges. That's just for me to feel comfortable. We also don't usually record in a room with air conditioning on. So this is a real treat yeah. for us personally. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for coming out. Today, as you obviously can tell, uh, we're going to be talking about analyzing the Avengers uh, we're going to be talking about stuff like that. Going through, we have some special guests, and we have a uh, couple prizes for the live studio audience. Uh, also, real quick, just in case you don't know, this is a spoiler warning for Avengers Endgame. <laughs> so if has anyone hasn't seen it. everybody <laughs> in this room seen Avengers Endgame? Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, we're going full-on spoilers, right? All right, um, so Ashley, let's talk about when Superman picked up Mjolnir. Uh, how was that scene? Uh, is, isn't that canon to the comics? <laughs> it is canon to the comics. <laughs> that's the thing that's actually happening. And he steals uh, Superman's shield. Oh, no, Superman. And he takes uh, Captain, Captain America's America shield. shield. So, yeah, yeah. That's enough of us talking. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So we got a couple really cool guests with us today to talk about analyzing the Avengers. So we want to bring them out really quickly. First off, we have... Uh, you know him as the host of the Riley Roundtable. You've seen him on Collider Live. He's an amazing writer, and he has the cutest dog ever. Please welcome Mr. Mark Riley. Woo! <laughs> Sporting not Superman today. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Yeah. And then after that, Miss Ashley, do you want to introduce our next guest? Sure. We are introducing a longtime Geek History Lesson fan, which is a very fun fact for me, and also the tallest star of Marvel's Runaways, Mr. Ryan Sand. <laughs> Ryan was also on The Wire, if that's not enough cool cred for you guys. <laughs> hey, everybody. I actually love that we have a real Marvel villain on our panel talking about the Avengers. I think this is really neat. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm feeling a little heroic today, though. Yeah. Not too villainous. Ryan, I got to ask you, though. You and Thanos, who wins? <laughs> Wait, with or without the stones? I mean, does, um, it, does it make it easier for you to beat him without the stones or harder? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. I, I think uh, Thanos, I, I would run from Thanos. I saw what he did to the Hulk. In Infinity War, and uh, yeah, that's enough of me. Well, real quick, to analyze our Avengers, let's get just a couple of sentences. What were your basic thoughts about Avengers Endgame? Mark, do you want to go first? Oh, boy, basic thoughts? Yeah. Oh, Lord. Uh, I love the movie. I love the movie. I think you look at it... Um, you can look at it as standalone. You can look at it as a sequel to 22 films. And I think it just worked. And I loved how emotional it was. I watched it again last night. And it just, I mean, how long do you have? I love this movie. And uh, That's all your time's it, it up. was great. Thank you. <laughs> um, the word that, that is um, just stuck in my head is epic. Um, as as a nerd, it was amazing seeing you know seeing that story come to life and seeing it culminate in that way. And as someone who appreciates storytelling, um, it's just it's such an achievement that has been taken <laughs> taken place over the years to to wrap up in that way. So it was um, it was really awesome. Ashley, as a person who just saw it last night in IMAX, what are, what are your basic thoughts just from last night? This is not my first time seeing it last night. <laughs> I saw it again last night. Um, I think it's a very fun clip show. I don't think it's a movie. I don't think it functions structurally the way movies function. But that doesn't mean that it's not great and that I did not enjoy it very much. But I'll never get over the fact that by the time the Hulk is talking to the ancient one, you're like 90 minutes into that movie and nothing has happened. Um, and I'm going to be mad about that until I die. But... Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Hawkeye fights the guy from Westworld. That happens. I haven't seen Westworld. Um, so I guess... Wait, wait, wait. 
Hawkeye tells his wife to put mustard on a hot dog. That's right. Uh, Linda Carlini's great. That's really cool. Um, yeah, so uh, the movie's great. Everyone loves it. I'm wrong. It's still not a movie. <laughs> Jason, what are your thoughts about Endgame? Uh, it's so damn bombastic that I love it. I mean, there's nothing else to say about it. I mean, yeah, it's got problems, but every movie's got problems. But, you know, I'm willing to ignore it. But so let, we're going to analyze each of the Avengers movies today. We're going to give a little commentary about it. We're going to give a little fun facts about it and our basic thoughts about that. Because the most interesting thing about Endgame is that Endgame is in Endgame. It's the end. So it's interesting to talk through these films kind of pick out character arcs, story beats, things that we think proceed through the whole thing. So we're going to start it off with Avengers, came out in 2012. Oh, by the way, spoilers for all these movies. <laughs> is, is, wait, is there anybody in this theater that hasn't seen one of the Avengers movies? There's only four. No? Okay, thank God. All right, cool. Uh, now, of course, I'm talking about the uh, Ray Fiennes, Uma Thurman movie, The Avengers. <laughs> Right? <laughs> You're not talking about the 1960s uh, television series with uh, Steed and Mrs. Peel? <laughs> uh, that was the big budget remake of that oh, series. <laughs> it's one of Sean Connery's last movies. Uh, so no, no, we're going to talk about The Avengers 2012. Basic info directed by Joss Whedon. Uh, screenplay by Joss Whedon. Uh, fun fact, it was Joss Whedon's idea, if you did not know this, that Marvel should have a larger villain in the movie to be in charge of Loki. So... We have Joss Whedon to thank for Thanos. They were never planning to do Thanos until Joss Whedon was like, hey, you know, Thanos should really be Loki's boss, guys. And they were like, okay, all right, let's do this. Um, I have a fun little prize for somebody in the audience right now. If anyone in the audience right now can tell me what is the first piece of dialogue said in Avengers number one, does anybody know it? I will also give you the prize if you can identify who is the first character to talk, to have that line of dialogue in the Avengers? Because it's not who you think it is. <laughs> Anybody? Yes, go ahead and guess. I know who it is, I think I know who it is. Is it Dr. Selvig? It is not Dr. Selvig. No, it is not. Anybody get, it? I, I, have, I have prizes, guys. I gotta give these prizes out. I will literally <laughs> throw these prizes at you from the audience. Does anybody else want to take a guess? Yes, sir. Right there. Captain America in the front row. Uh, is it Nick Fury? It is not Nick Fury. No. Uh, yes, sir. Right there. I don't know what the quote is, but I think it was Loki. Wasn't he talking to the... You're closer. It is not Loki. It is actually not any of the main cast members. Uh, the first line of dialogue is spoken by the other that little guy that is, uh, you know, Thanos. And he says, the Tesseract has awakened. But since you said Loki and you're really close, I'm still going to give you a prize out of this bag. Here, Ashley. Thank you. You get this little Captain Marvel diorama thing that is made of plastic. <laughs> Yay! Just what you always wanted. <laughs> All right, tell us some more about the Avengers. All right, so I want to talk to uh, Mark and Riley. Ryan, excuse me. I, I almost called you. I almost called you Riley, All and right. you Mark. Oh, you're just now Riley, Ryan. There you go. <laughs> uh, too many R's. Um, either of you, who do you feel has the best character arc in Avengers One? And that's an interesting question because Avengers One is. Probably of all of these movies, the most group movie, like kind of everybody has equal billing, but do you feel that there is a character that outshines the others in Avengers 1? Whoever feels free to want to jump in on that. Okay. I've been going back and forth on this one. Um, you know, I tend to think it's Tony Stark um, because of what he goes through with Cap, and you know, there's that, there's that great scene with Cap on the helicarrier, um, that it's like, you're, you're nothing more than a, like a guy that, uh, just in a suit, you know, you don't, you, you don't take this seriously. And by the end of the movie, you know, of course, Tony takes one for the team, almost is going to die, goes into the portal, which then sets up Iron Man three and a journey that he then has through that, you know, dealing with PTSD and, and the effects of that. There's something bigger out there. And this guy was, you know, he liked, I, what I love about Tony Stark at the end of Iron Man is that you almost think that he wants to take credit for Iron Man because of the publicity of it. So, and you can kind of think about that with Tony Stark and his ego, but then by the end of Avengers, it's like, no, I have to save the world now and I'll do this. I might die, but I will do this. So I think he has the strongest arc. 
I think that's a really interesting observation. And I would agree with that because after Avengers, Tony Stark becomes the best villain the MCU has ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> kind of does. Yeah, I agree. I think it's Tony. Um, when you look at, you look at his motivation to put on this, the, uh, the, the armor, you know, it was trying to back in, in the first Iron Man, you know, he was trying to, I guess, you know, right his, his wrongs, you know, the, the role that he played in, in creating these weapons that ended up taking innocent lives and, and everything. And so it wasn't necessarily his, his, um, this thing that he had inside of him to, to save the world. Um, but that is exactly where he ended up. And, and just, just like Mark said, you know, the, the, the standoff between him and Cap and, and just the, um, the fact that he, he had no way of knowing that he would ever come back after as he goes up in, into that portal with that missile. So I think him being willing to um, give the ultimate sacrifice, I think that just that's just an amazing arc for him. I'm sad that no one mentioned the most poignant character arc of the entire movie, Space Slug number three. <laughs> he comes down. He just wants to eat some humans. That's all he wants to do. It's his job. He eats, eat humans. Mm. And the Hulk kills him. <laughs> he didn't know the Hulk was going to kill him. He didn't know this guy was all anger. He was just following this shiny golden metal toy that talked like Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> he does get an amazing return cameo in Endgame that I don't think was part of the initial contract, though. So good for him and his agent. <laughs> right, that, that is a good thing. Uh, yeah, Space Slug number three. Like, it, it's, it, it, it's sad. I mean, I'm going to be excited when I see him in Dune. I'm just going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to, I want to, this is an interesting question. This is the kind of the only time you can ask this question with all the Avengers movies. Is there a character and Ashley, Ryan, Mark, is there a character in Avengers one that you think should have been part of the team since movie one? Did they leave anybody out? Now, Ashley and I sometimes talk about this in the podcast. I don't know if you want to go on this is, is the wasp. Yeah. I was like, is everyone here listening to the podcast in the past? Yes. Yes, <laughs> it's the Wasp. It's so insulting that she's not a part of the first Avengers lineup. Leave off Ant-Man. No one cares about Ant-Man. That's fine. <laughs> the, <laughs> the Wasp, even if you want to make her hope instead of Janet, she's a founding Avenger. She names the Avengers. Um, and then truly, you don't have to echo the shot that we get in Endgame where it's like the She-Avengers finally, they deign to let there be more than right, one right. woman on the Avenger after 22 say, say that title again. The She-Avengers, the Pre-Avengers, the Revengers. That's uh, phase four, everybody. She-Avengers. She She-Avengers. I think in the Marvel comic universe, they're called uh, A-Force, A-Force is the all-lady team. Yeah. Um, but I think the Wasp, I think that was a big missed opportunity. Um I think there could have been better casting outside of the characters they had too, but <laughs> my, for me, the big one is the Wasp. Mark Ryan, anybody you think that they should have put on that team? I was, I'm with you, Ashley. I was, but introduce Hank Pym in Avengers with his daughter, Hope or Janet, what do you, uh, whatever you want to call, because then that would, for me, set up Avengers Ultron. Mm-hmm. You know, by having Hank Pym a part of it and bring in Michael Douglas. Have him do it in uh, the same deal so we can set up Scott Lang later on down the line. But I always thought Hank Pym would be an interesting one with his daughter so that she could be a founding member of the Avengers because of the comic history. I don't mean to rewrite the Marvel Cinematic Universe here. But, but we should. You're, we should. Yeah. You're, Mark, Mark Riley and I uh, have done this several times in his Riley Roundtable podcast where we'll just take movies and rewrite them. Yeah. Um, your pitch that you just gave with an old Michael Douglas. Mm-hmm. The one part of Ant-Man that Ashley and I always jive against is the fact that Hope is very talented, she's very smart, and she should actually be the Ant-Man. She should, you know, they, they shouldn't have just got this guy from prison to just do it. This guy, they have no idea who they yeah, is. Right. Um, if Hope was in that movie, and the Wasp was in Avengers 1, and let's say Space Slug number 3 injured her, then it makes sense in Ant-Man why he's like, I can't put you in battle again. Space Slug number three hurt you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I thought it could set up and go through their movies, but she's a founding member and she is in it. And maybe not in Avengers. Maybe it's like she is told by Hank not to be get involved or, or something like that that sets up a stronger arc for later. But I would have introduced her a lot sooner. If anyone would like to draw us of art of Space Slug number three attacking Hope, we would love to see that. <laughs> All right, Ryan, what are your thoughts? I think I want to draw that picture. 
<laughs> oh, yeah, Ryan also, if anyone backed our science campaign, Ryan did one of our prints for that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, okay, so are we talking about who would make an impact on like you know on on the battle like who who should we we bring in to to make that impact or, or just from a, a storytelling perspective who could be a little more interesting? Why don't you tell us both? <laughs> Ooh, okay. Well, well, I was thinking about the battle and thinking about where we were. Um, Rhodey could have been a quick call mm -hmm. um, because like Iron Man, he did a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of damage um, to to the Chitari. So I thought that. Um, like it's easy to say, Cap. Like Captain Marvel, yeah. Okay, she could have come in and wiped out everybody in ten seconds. But from from for where we were in the in the movies, I think Rhodey would have been a, a a quick call to hey suit up. You know, we need some need some help. Um, from a story perspective, like what what would have been more interesting? Oh, uh, that's tough. That's tough. I gotta I gotta think about that one. It's hard not to just put your fan girl boy and by hat on and just be like oh well I really like Kamala Khan so that's who right, it should have right, been right, right. even though that makes no narrative sense <laughs> or Spider-Man or anything exactly, else like that exactly because that was like my first pull but I'm just going to throw this out there right now you could throw Kamala Khan into any Marvel movie and it's suddenly a plus up for me right. like I'm just like right. plus, plus five HP right there <laughs> Uh, all right, so let's move. Did you did you uh, any have any more you want to add? No, I'm to that, good. Ryan? I'm good. I'll uh, hold this up. Ashley, why don't you take us through Avengers: Age of Ultron, or as I like to call it, the Avengers versus James Spader? Uh, I really have to refer to my notes on this because I've seen this movie exactly one time. Uh, Avengers: Age of Ultron came out in 2015, directed and written by Joss Whedon, of course. Uh, fun fact, Thanos was considered to be the next villain. Oh, look, this is Jason's same fun fact. Um, but Joss Whedon decided against him in favor of Ultron and said, quote, we need to stay grounded. It's part of what makes the Marvel Universe click. Really? Grounded? <laughs> Their relationship to the real world. Thanos is not out of the mix, but Thanos was never meant to be the next villain, end quote. Um, probably yeah. because we're just beginning to introduce some of the more cosmic elements at this time. Well, well, it is a, there's a story behind that is that when he gave the idea to Marvel about Thanos for Avengers 1 and do, did that little end credit scene, it was very similar to the idea of adding Nick Fury to Iron Man 1, which was not in the original script at all. They eventually were just like, why don't we talk to some Marvel writers? They talked to Brian Michael Bendis, and Brian Michael Bendis was like, hey, you should do this scene with Nick Fury, and he says, Avengers. So the Thanos thing came along in the same way, and because of the Thanos scene, and they saw how people reacted to it, they immediately, Kevin Feige was like, all right, Avengers 2 versus Thanos. And Joss Whedon was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down, buddy. <laughs> Easy there. So that's basically how that came about. Uh, also, fun fact, the OG Thanos, played by Damien Poitier, a friend of ours, um, who has also been Ryan's stunt double. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> that's... Uh, that's Small world. Yeah, Damien has the best chin in the industry. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Um, okay, we have another trivia question. You guys got to get us do right by us. Can anyone in the audience tell me the very first line of dialogue from Avengers Age of Ultron or who spoke it? Here's a hint. It's one of the Avengers. <laughs> anyone? Your Doo. prize is this Miles Morales stocking hat. <laughs> doo, 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 doo. We're going to make this a little easier. I'll even give you the prize if you get the second character. It's a really quick exchange. One character goes, blank. And the other character goes, blank. You give me either character, you win this. All right. Oh, I saw I saw Miss Victoria back there. Uh, is it Tony Stark? It is Tony Stark. And the line is, shit. And then, <laughs> language, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They get more sweary as you go along. And by the time you get to Endgame, you're like, they're swearing all over the place. And you like, I clutch my white lady pearls because I don't know what's happening anymore. <laughs> it's, it surprised me when I was doing research for this, too. I was like, oh, yeah, the first line of Age of Ultron is Tony Stark going, shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and that might have been the first time we got a real curse word in a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie. Maybe, yeah. Uh, I don't know. That's a made-up fact. You're welcome. So, Age of Ultron, not as well-received uh, as the OG Avengers movie. But same question as last time. Who do you think has the best character arc in uh, Age of Ultron? Um, first Avenger that comes to mind is the Hulk. Um, I think, you know, starting off 
with him just just being you know the the perfect weapon that that they've apparently got under control a little bit um and he loses control um uh, due to the scarlet witch in the middle and just you know rampages um and and banner you know has to deal with with the the repercussions of all of that you know and he's struggling with it contemplating moving forward with with uh black widow and you know then they he has to go to work again at the end and uh but then making as hulk making the decision to let me save widow and i'm just going to jump on a quinjet and just go wherever it'll take me um i thought that i just i really liked his arc and and all of the the different places where we uh we saw him go would you have liked to seen him and natasha actually get to explore a relationship beyond just one movie um, that would have been interesting. Yeah, it's, you know, a lot of questions. Because um, they kind of... <laughs> would have to be answered. A um, lot of questions. But yeah, that would, would have been interesting. It, it kind of, you know, I just remember it catching me off guard. Like, wait a minute, at the party, is she just just messing with him? Is she really <laughs> digging Banner over there? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it would have been fun to, to see where that went. Because their romance kind of goes the way of uh, cinematic universe villains. Like, it's a very one and done sort of treatment. Well, he says, hey, Nat, in the next movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then he gets really upset when she uh, bites it in Endgame, yeah. and that, that's kind of about it, and then throws the bench. So yeah. that's how men express their feelings, right? You throw benches around. That's how I do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm with you. I was uh, Hulk has the best character arc, and uh, I would, since you, you pretty much said exactly what I was feeling, you know, just about the controlling of the anger, deciding to, you know what, I'm getting in this ship and I'm flying out of here. I'm going to take myself out of the equation. Um, I would say Black Widow has the next one because of that relationship. It was something that I wish we did get to see uh, that didn't end with a bench being thrown, you know, but a little bit more deep because I thought that was a very interesting dynamic that she would say the sun is setting and he would get, you know, she was the one that could tame the beast. And so you could see the love in there. And so then when he does fly away, when Bruce or Hulk decides to take himself out of it, her her reaction to that is... It's, it's pretty nice, and uh, I think she has a pretty damn good arc because of it. And it leaves all of us sitting there going, are we going to get Planet Hulk? Are we going to get Planet Hulk? Are we going to yeah. get Planet Hulk? Kind of. <laughs> Jason, is there anyone other than Hulk who stands out for you? I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Ultron Bot 1701. <laughs> uh, that's the one that's hit by Thor with the hammer in the slow motion shot. And that nanosecond of that shot, I, I think you sense the pain of this guy who just... You know, he came from Ohio with a dream, <laughs> and it was taken away by metal. I'm not going to lie. I thought you were going to make up a secret triplet for, uh, for Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. That's Doug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as our Geek House and fans love, what does uh, Doug sound like? <laughs> can, can, we, can we get a voice for Doug? Oh, God. Uh, Hello, hello, Wanda. Hello. <laughs> I'm, I'm Doug. <laughs> you know what his powers are? No. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Look forward for Doug to return to the Christmas episode this year. Um, there actually is an Age of Ultron, and it's funny. Um, I, I, this is kind of going to jump ahead to our in game uh, discussion. There is a moment in Age of Ultron that I really wish in game connected to. When Hawkeye. Does he puts on the time travel suit for the very first time in Endgame, and they do the test run, and he shows up in his barn. I was expecting that to be the scene in Age of Ultron, because if you remember, Tony Stark gets really mad at one point, and he just goes out to the barn and starts fiddling with the tractor, and then Nick Fury comes from nowhere. Like, Nick Fury just walks up and is like, what you doing, Tony? That's a terrible Sam Jackson. Uh, but he, like, walks out of nowhere, and when he went to the barn, when Hawkeye showed up in the barn, I was like, Oh man, please, please have Nick Fury be there and have Nick Fury. Well, just no, like have Nick Fury be like, what's up, Clint? And just like, what? What are you know, like whatever. And the idea that Nick Fury has known about this for years, because I think one of the people that gets short shifted the most in Endgame is Nick Fury. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't even get a line. Um, but I, I just think that would have been an interesting wrinkle in the whole thing. Uh, something I would love to see from the audience, just by raise of hands. Do you like Age of Ultron? Raise your hand right now if you do. There's no wrong answer. <laughs> we're not judging anyone. Okay, so we're about 50-50. It's very interesting. Now, I would love to talk through everybody on stage here. 
it's kind of the least liked Avengers movie of the four. And it's the same director. It's the same cast. Ultron's a good villain. Do we think, what's, what do we think the reason is? Why does Age of Ultron, the least successful Avengers movie, what is it? Mark, do you have any ideas? I mean, I think it, it, it's interesting because Avengers comes out and it, it blows the socks off of the box office. The fans loved it. And then we're off and running really deep into the MCU, get Iron Man 3, introduce some more uh, standalones. So when Age of Ultron comes in and the fans don't dig it as much as the Avengers, you know, it kind of gets forgotten about you. And then Infinity War rolls around and everybody's talking about that one. So it's like Age of Ultron has become like the Jan Brady of the Avengers. It's like, you know, nobody's talking about it when I think it's very underrated as a great villain. I love James Spader and there's some great moments. I mean, the Hulk armor fight is one of the best uh, things in that movie. I love getting Vision introduced in this thing. That that actually would be my real pick for the best character of the movie is Vision. Vision's great. Yeah, I I would say Vision's a a great, that's a good call. Um, But yeah, I think maybe it just had to do with, you know, living up to the the big huge Avengers reveal, you know, in the original movie, we got all the, you know, Marvel did it, and oh my God, they stuck the landing. And then afterwards it's Avengers Infinity War, it's Thanos, and then oh my God, they all turned to dust. What now? So it's always forgotten now and not really mentioned. Ryan, how do you feel about Age of Ultron? I agree with Mark. I think um I just rewatched it recently and um, you know, I was trying to put my finger on it. And I think Having the opening act of the Avengers, you know, just just blow everybody away. Um, You know, what an amazing accomplishment. And it was so well done that, you know, it was a a tough act to follow. Um, It was a tough, um, a tough act to to like improve upon, you know. Well, can I ask a follow up question with this? Do we think there is any movie, any story they could have released that we would have liked? Or, or was it automatically just doomed? Was Avengers 2 just doomed to be like, ah, okay. Uh, the, the very first thing that came to mind, it, it, you know, it couldn't have been done right. And that was uh, the Secret Wars. Like, mm. you know, rights everywhere. You know, a lot of those characters weren't introduced, so it would have been too hard to, to kind of pull off. But that's the first, like, spectacle or, like, Avengers versus X Men, or you know, just just something that big to to top uh, what what we just saw. Um, those are the first things that that came to mind. I'll probably think of like three more on the ride home, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I you know, yeah, I don't I don't get what um, what the disconnect um, really was with Age of Ultron, but but in rewatching it after watching Endgame, there was this little reference that this this little line that that. Tony dropped that I thought was just like so cool when they're at the Barton's place and and uh Tony and and Steve are talking and you know Tony is is talking about being able to to you know put the 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 mechanism in place so they're no longer needed and he talked about liking what Barton had here and that's what he ends up with in Endgame, basically, you know, just the 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 same thing. That's where he ended up with the with the wife, with the kid, mm-hmm. middle of nowhere, you know, living the living the the farm life. So yeah, I thought that was really cool. All right, so let's move on to a movie that we all saw very recently. Avengers: Infinity War came out in 2018. It was directed by Anthony Russo and Joe Russo. Screenplay by Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. By the way, we got, I want to give a shout out to those two gentlemen, right. Christopher Marcus right. and Stephen McFeely, because they wrote a script. Yes, they're here. Clap. Uh, Christopher and Stephen, come in! No. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, they, in, they wrote the screenplay for Endgame and Infinity War, and they did a lot of heavy lifting with their words. These Infinity War could have been a giant mess. And it, by all accounts and all rights, it kind of should have been. So the fact that, that they made two movies that are so bombastic, so huge, and that we understand all the character motivations and the plot is just astounding. It's, it, it's amazing. So those guys need uh, as much money and shout outs as they can ever get. Uh, so fun facts about this movie. If I could turn my page, I can't. Uh, I beat you. Uh, I have a, one more prize for somebody out in the audience. is an Iron Man related item. Uh, Ashley's pulling it out of the bag right now. Can anybody in the audience tell me the character 
or even the first line that is spoken in Avengers Infinity War. It's on Netflix. Yes, sir, right there with the West Coast Avengers shirt. That is correct. It is Ebony Ma. You win this Iron Man puzzle can thing that I have. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it is Ebony Ma. He says uh, it's it's a shot of his feet, and he says, "Hear me and rejoice. You are about to be killed by Thanos." Blah 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 blah. Uh, fun fact: Avengers Endgame return uh, features the surprise return. Nobody expect, expected this. Space Slug number three <laughs> pops up again. God, his performance is amazing. I just want to say that I'm really impressed that you knew the name Ebony Ma because I just called them all the great people. Like, I can't be bothered to learn any of their names. So kudos for that. Uh, that's a, that's, that is a great Mind University student back there. I love this. Uh, so fun fact, uh, in the movie, of course, the Incredible Hulk uh, is sent away from that ship and crashes through the window of the Sanctum Sanctorum. That is actually a direct reference to the Infinity Gauntlet number one comic book series. But in the comic book, it's the Silver Surfer that crashes through the window, not the Hulk, but I like that they did that. Um, all right, who has the best character arc in Avengers Infinity War? I'm going to start on this because I want to talk about Thor. Yes. I want to talk about yes. Thor. Yes. Uh, yes. yes, yeah. I, I, so many yeses, so I think I hit on the right thing. Um, you know, no yeses for Space Log number three. I'm disappointed. Um, I mean, he's in the flashback with Gamora, guys. Go look for him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he knows his death's a coming, and it's so sad. But anyways, uh, Thor in this movie, I think even more so than Thor Ragnarok, finally becomes a god in this movie. And I'm going to say this, in Infinity War, I think Thor has the only stand up and cheer moment when he rockets in onto Wakanda and that Avengers theme swells and another uh, undersung hero um, uh, help me out this Mr. Uh, movie trivia champion Mark Riley uh, Alvin, Alan Silvestri is Alan the Silvestri. Alan Silvestri score he hides the Avengers theme you do not hear it in Infinity War except for the title credits until Thor shows up and what a an amazing moment that is and when he shows up he's got the red cape again he's got both eyes again and he's just bring me Thanos I can remember when Infinity War came out last year so many people shared that gift before anybody had seen that movie I so people were being spoiled left and right with that moment but it, I can get it because that moment is just like goosebumps Ashley um, how do you feel who do you feel has the biggest character arc of Infinity War it's tough with Infinity War and Endgame not to just default to uh, Cap because it's very much an ending to his story. I think Thor is a good contender for Infinity War, but my favorite moment is with Steve. So that's why I feel like I want to go. Like my favorite joke in the entire MCU is uh, I am Groot, I am Steve Rogers. <laughs> because it's so innocent and it's so it's like watching a child. Like it's so there's no guile there. It's so pure. Um but I also think Black Panther's really good in that movie, and it's perhaps because it's coming right on the heels of his own movie, but like Thor, you really get to see T'Challa be a king and be the leader and sort of live in that space uh, before he gets dusted away. Gentlemen, hmm. Infinity War. Infinity War, since, uh, yeah, I agree with you on Thor, so I'm gonna go to his sidekick, Rocket Raccoon, yes. <laughs> yeah. A uh, raccoon had a freaking great arc in a movie. He's not a raccoon. He is, he right. <laughs> he still eats He's garbage. He's a sweet <laughs> rabbit, Ashley. He's a sweet, sweet rabbit. Um, because that is my favorite part of the movie. I shared yeah. that gif a number of times after, of course, uh, people <laughs> saw it. Um, but with Thor having lost basically everything, um, you know, and there's Rocket who who actually sits there and goes, ha, ah, got to be the captain now. And he goes over and he sits down to talk to Thor. And then they have this great relationship that then carries over into the next movie. But Rocket's on his shoulder when they arrive and, and Sylvester's score is playing. But I, I just, I was blown away by how much I cared for what Rocket was doing and how he was separated. He, he kind of puffed himself up going, I'm the captain, but then he's going to go. He wants to see where they make the weapons and he wants to get them. And that's a big joke of his throughout all the movies he's in. But I, I could really see Rocket starting to care about Thor and that relationship really gelled so well that when they arrive on Wakanda, it's the best part of the movie. I, it was my favorite part for sure. Yeah. hundred percent. Ryan, how about you? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement. I believe it was Thor. 
um, to just the, the, the journey that, that he went on, you know, where we find him floating in space and um, practically killing himself to, to get Stormbreaker and, and to have that triumphant, heroic moment at the end that yeah i mean i, I can i remember just the the sound in in the theater when when um thor joins the battle to making that mistake you know not not going for the head um but i'm trying to think of a of a of the number 2 arc but i i think what moved me the most was probably um the visions visions arc um because he he tried you know he was telling Wanda to to leave me in the in the beginning you know just just to to go I'm I'm not going to make it and um in the at the end with him just just telling Wanda look it's it's basically you know it's it's okay I forgot what what he said what what did he say I I only I can only see you I can only hear you he says you could never hurt me I only see you I love you yeah yeah and that was just so poignant and and just so like selfless that that sacrifice and then to basically have to get killed twice was just <laughs> was tough <laughs> but uh yeah I, I i agree i think that that was um when it comes to arc i think it was thor i think it's so interesting that jason said thor because we talked about this lesson and what we were going to talk about at this event and you had initially said that you thought thanos had the best arc of infinity war <laughs> I guess I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess I forgot. I mean, Thanos has a great arc because you have to think about this is one of the few movies. And I'm certain there are, are other movies where the villain wins. Thanos wins. And again, going back to the screenwriters, they talked about when they were coming up with this movie, they could not figure out who was the protagonist of this movie. Who do we keep cutting back to? And they said that the movie only clicked when they were like, oh, we should go back to Thanos. When whenever we're in, like, we don't know what to do next. Well, let's check in on Thanos. What's he doing? Oh, yeah, he's walking on Voromir. Oh, okay, cool. What's he doing now? Oh, he's killing Gamora? Oh, man. Oh, what's he doing over here? Sitting in the thing? Okay, cool. He has a lot of monologues in that movie, too, and I don't find many of them to be boring. There are, his monologue, I will say this, his monologue at the very end of Endgame, I think, is a little boring, and and it reminds me of the moment in The Incredibles where uh, Syndrome was like, you got me monologuing. Because there, there is one moment in game, we can talk about this more, um, when he could easily take out Captain America, but he stops to monologue. And I'm like, oh, come on, man. You're going to win. Stop. <laughs> like, because think about it. If he had just stopped monologuing, stepped on Captain America's neck, when Sam radios in, nobody answers. Yeah. Sam's like, cat, cat. I think he went. I think he went somewhere else. We should go somewhere else, do we? So we go, do we even bother? Doctor Strange, what do you think? Well, no? okay, cool. You know, like, <laughs> like that. That's that conversation. It just goes credits. <laughs> Jason, what oh, what would Doctor Strange think? <laughs> oh, Jesus, <laughs> you guys are putting me on. You guys are putting me on the spot here. Uh, <laughs> Doctor Strange, my friends, would probably have gone to a Chipotle instead of going to New Jersey or New York. Where are the Avengers based? New York. Yes, I live there, don't I? <laughs> Only half the year. Nice. Where do you spend the other half of the year? The Dark Dimension! Yes, uh, there you go. Some inside. Fun fact, we also thought about doing an announcement to turn your phones off before this started as Doctor Strange and Clea, but we scrapped that. <laughs> there's an early, there's an early uh, planning session of this show where we almost just did Doctor Strange and Clea the entire hour. And I thought nobody would have sat for that. Not a single person would have sat for that. Uh, just wait till the Doug hour comes. Uh, all right, so Ashley, why don't you take us through in-game and then we're going to like wrap this up with some discussions. Cool. So Endgame came out like 10 days ago. It's uh, also directed by the Russo screenplay by Marcus and McFeely. Same guys what did Infinity War, written and created at the same time, which is why uh, you love them so much. Fun fact, with this film, Robert Downey Jr. officially surpassed Hugh Jackman's record for most appearances in a film as the same superhero with 10 um, if you don't know, if you are a union actor in SAG-AFTRA, if you play a character in a movie 
Not on TV. So Ryan doesn't get this good pay bump. If you get, play a character more than three times in a movie and the part of the same franchise, you get a significant pay bump each time for fear that you are being typecast and you will never, ever be able to play anything else, uh, which is a problem that I would very much like to have. Uh, so it's a big deal when people like Hugh Jackman and Robert Downey Jr. Uh, reprise these roles so many times. And uh, let's be honest, and I know this is a discussion uh, that people have had before, if we have to replace the Stan Lee cameos with someone else, uh, RDJ is a good contender for that. So, favorite character arcs or scenes? Mm, okay. Because um, we've all seen this uh, baby yeah. twice. <laughs> I'd say Hawkeye. Mm. I mean, you know, I thought it was unfair to start off with Hawkeye like that because, mm -hmm. like, y'all, you guys caught me off guard. I, I, I'm feeling, mm -hmm. I'm in my feels, as the young people say. Uh, um, did you guys, did I, you guys know that that was originally the final scene of Infinity War? Really? Ooh. Yeah, they decided the last Ooh. minute to not make that the last scene because we hadn't seen Hawkeye the entire movie, and they were like, well, it's a little weird that this is the only scene we saw him in. It, it, that, that, that was, and in the original cut of, uh, yeah, Infinity War, that was the final scene. I, yeah, I could see that. Um, but yeah, just like us knowing what, what happened, and, and Jeremy Renner killed it, um, you know, and, and just to see him look around and just see that dust just, just to, to blowing in the wind behind him, and uh, just the, the, the look, the confusion and the fear on his face, you know, so we, we start there and then we meet up with him as this killing machine, <laughs> <as> <laughs> Ronan, um, um, to someone who really kind of has nothing to live for um, uh, other than, you know, this, this, um, this mission of, of death <laughs> that, that he, he undertook. But um, him sac willing to sacrifice himself like I that kind of um I, I got the friendship between uh he and um, um the Black Widow you know I, the, that they have history and I could see either one of them being willing to take the bullet for each other but I think the magnitude of that decision was just amplified by the fact that he's on this mission to hopefully get his family back um and uh then you know to to have him go through everything and and to to see that phone ring at the end was just like a really um you know that was like his there's his like an hour left of the movie after that that's not yeah. the end <laughs> well it, it's funny so uh, there have been a lot of articles lately about people talking about plot holes with the time travel stuff and everything like that and what you talked about with the phone this to me is the biggest plot hole mm -hmm. of the entire MCU so worse to believe that Clint Barton saw his family disappear said, I'm going to dress up like a ninja and just kill people <laughs> across the world for five years. He's going mad with bloodlust. But he pays his wife's sprint bill for five years. <laughs> and keeps her phone charged? <laughs> oh, okay. It was automatic like, debit. Yeah. I, um, especially watching it the second time, I really appreciate Clint and Nat's relationship because by having them be the ones who have to decide who's going to sacrifice themselves, they show that the power of their friendship is as equal to a romantic love or a familial love because it could have been so easy in any of those scenes to just have them kiss or to have one of them go too far. And because we're so used to seeing that in movies, you would have been like, oh, okay, weird, I guess, fine. But they don't. They stick it strictly platonic. And that's something that I have a lot of respect for in the MCU. Here, here. Yeah, I was thinking about that even last night yeah. in my second watch when they're flying. He goes, this is... And, you know, something about, like, remember Budapest and never like this. Which, and, that's a joke, I think, from the first, the first one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so and it occurred to me um, that I'm like, I love that they just remain friends the whole time. Uh, as far as arcs go, I got to go with Cap. Cap's, it's, it's just beautiful, that, that ending with him. Um, that he decides to stay in the past and, and to live the life that he always wanted to live. To get that second chance. Um, and, and... That's something big for Cap to do, I think, because he's Captain America. He, he you know, he's 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 gonna do good 
no matter where he is. So now I wonder what good he did do back in the 40s with Peggy, because I think that uh, you're not going to be able to keep a man. The MCU uh, doesn't have the rating system set up to find out the good that he did with Peggy. I'm just saying, (laughs) that's a different type of MCU movie. (laughs) That is a different type of MCU film. We're uh, not in the valley. Calm down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but I, I'm actually very much wondering if um, if there might be something explored in the future, uh, like a Disney Plus streaming service or whatever, that what did Cap do? Um, you know, or did he just lay low? Because there was a frozen Cap out there at the same time, I'm assuming. I, I agree with you, Mark. I, I mean, to me, this – I know Tony probably has the more complete arc – and I, yeah, yeah, but I and and I would be remiss not to mention for it, me, but. yeah, yeah, for me, it's Cap. Like it yeah. is Cap's arc, and and it's interesting. You talked about as far as I'm concerned, I hope they never revisit it. I I don't Same. ever want a hint. I I don't want to see Peggy anymore. I, I I put them. They got their happy ending. Send them off into the sunset. Don't ever tell us anything about them because to me. You know, there there's some parts of that. Again, this is part of the movie where the time travel logic starts imposing. Where you're just like, well, wait a minute, that's not really his Peggy because it's an alternate timeline. That's not really our Peggy. That's not you know, it gets confusing. But I like to think about it that it is our Peggy. That is our timeline. Mm-hmm. And Cap, like some storylines for Superman, where Superman, there's been an alternate Superman in a different world, and he's like, well, I can't interfere because it'll mess up the timeline. That's what I feel Cap has, is doing. He's like, I can't interfere because it'll screw up the timeline so I have to sit down um, it's funny Ashley and I kind of wrote what we thought happens to Cap after that movie because again how does he walk around in that world without everybody being like Captain America right. um, because they would actually know his face because he was world famous back then so I think he grows a beard grows long hair we came up with the name that he calls himself um, Anthony Carter mm. and he becomes a comic book artist drawing the Captain America comic books. That's canon. That's canon in in some of the original Captain America comics. Like Steve draws the Captain America comics, um, and we know that Peggy has two children, so they have yep. two baby super soldiers, maybe depending on comic book logic. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but that's one of my favorite things because in the first Avenger, you see him drawing that funny little monkey. So he, we know that this Steve has artistic ability. And so it's kind of nice where he talks about, he says that line, he's like, I thought it'd be nice to get a piece of that life, that piece of that living that Tony was talking about. And to me, his living is, you know, drawn comic books. And uh, trying to forget that he kissed Sharon Carter once, who's he's now related to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Luke and Leia got over it. So, you know. Um, I, I would love to hear from either of you. We know basically where Endgame has ended. And we know that this is definitely not going to be the last Avengers movie, especially when it becomes the highest grossing movie of all time, which it looks like it's going to be. I saw actually a very funny meme today where it was uh, Sam and Steve from Winter Soldier running and the they put on Sam's shirt Titanic and then they put um, or no Avatar, excuse me. And then Steve has Avengers Endgame. And he's like on your left, like he's going to pass him. Mm-hmm. Although Zoe Saldana is in both of those movies. So she's laughing all the way to the bank. Yeah, she is. <laughs> Hello, listeners. Dr. Strange here, transmitting from the Dark Dimension to interrupt your podcast to let you know that there's soon a threat. Yes, a threat from Dormammu. He is slowly encroaching into your dimension, and the only way that you can stop him is by building a website. I know this sounds strange, but I have considered the runes, and I have looked at the signs, and I have figured out that the only way to defeat Dormammu and his dark magic is to build your own website using Wix. Now, the good thing about this is I have looked with the Time Stone and have discovered that over 140 million people use Wix already. So if you join those 140 million people, you start and publish your free website with hundreds of design features and apps to grow your brand online, including menus and forms and lists and social bars. Ooh, I love I love a good... Doctor Strange, actually, fun fact, one time on a trip, I loved going to a social bar. But this is probably not the same social bar. But if you build your website with Wix.com, you can join your magic with me, consult the runestones, and together we can defeat Dormammu in his dark magic! You have to go right now 
to wix.com. That's wix.com slash podcast. And you will get 10% off. That is wix.com slash podcast. Use this easy to use website builder, this drag and drop builder, and help Doctor Strange defeat Dormammu and his dark magic. Now back to the show. But we so we know that we're probably going to get some new Avengers. We we assume we're probably going to get a movie called New Avengers down the line. I, I hope they wait on that a little bit. I hope we get to like not see the Avengers movies for a while. So when it comes back, it's a big deal. But um, we're going in this brand new MCU. We don't really know what the next batch of movies are. I would love to hear from either of you. Is there a Marvel character or even a wild card character that you would love to see a movie about? You would love to see it join the Avengers? Is there somebody that you feel, man, this is their time. This is the time to give them their shot, their chance on the Avengers. I'm going to go crazy. Please do. Sentry. <laughs> Because of that great run that Brian Michael Bendis did in New Avengers, yeah. when the raft, um, the the big break and Sentry, who is one of the people, but he's like Superman. He's he's damn strong and damn important in the MC, uh, like. I would love to see him uh, be get his own movie, be a part of uh, the MCU. Do they own that that right? They do. They I'm do. sure they yes. do. Right? It's not because we have Namor and. Um, Hulk owned by Universal, but they can team up. Um, and for that matter, Namor. I would I would love Namor to be. I really hope we. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but I think I think they're going there. Uh, there was some hints in Endgame. I, yeah, the in-game line about the earthquake underneath the Atlantic Ocean to yep. me was definitely a hint towards Namor. Yeah. That's exactly where I was going. I've wanted to see like Namor has always been one of my favorites because he's been such a jerk. Um, and he's, you know, so powerful and, and such, such a jerk. Um, and I think that, that, you know, seeing um, when I was watching Aquaman, you know, it's like, wow, I wonder what, you know, what would, would Namor's world look like, you know? Um, and, um, yeah. So, so when they talk about the, those earthquakes, you know, I, I just started smiling, like, could, could they sneak something in here? But, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot. Mm hmm as we all know, Namor has little wings on the side of his ankles. Right. Do we do a winged Namor or a non-winged Namor? That's, yeah, some little baby wings. <laughs> no, no. So bold I, I think bold choice, tough. Ryan. Bold choice. <laughs> I, that's, I think that's a, that's, a tough, that's a tough call right there. Because, I mean, like, how do they work? Yeah. I don't think I they do. Was, yeah, you know. So. Well, they, you would have to assume, right, that they work um, sort of like a, a fin, a tail fin, right? Yeah. Where they have the little... Yeah, you know, it'd be funny if they were a little... universal symbol for something. Um, like, you would assume it has to be something like a fish, but they didn't let Cap have actual little wings on the side of his helmet, so I don't right. think they would let Namor have wings on the side of his feet. Yeah, he's probably going to have tattoos, little wing tattoos on oh, his Oh, that's ankles. cool. <laughs> um, I want Vision back. I was super mad that we didn't get Vision back. I know he has a stone in his forehead, and I assume that that's what the Scarlet Witch and Vision TV show is going to be exploring, is how we bring him back and maybe we get like a, a Tom King murder mystery out of it. That would be really, really cool. Um, I know everyone wants the Fantastic Four, but I just want to like jump over them and do the Future Foundation because that's my favorite yeah. part of the Fantastic Four is their weird school. Um, and I said this as a joke, but now I kind of mean it. Um, they recently in the comics, uh, Franklin and Valeria, their kids came back and they were adults and they were super powerful. And I want Chris Evans to play grown up Franklin Richards so that we can go full circle on his time in the MCU and as a member of the Fantastic Four. Hilarious. <laughs> what? <laughs> I said that to you as we were leaving the screening, literally. <laughs> Wow, I think I, I deleted that out of my brain. <laughs> Please, Marvel executives, don't listen to this podcast. <laughs> wow, I mean, that's, that's way insider. I, I almost think that's too nerdy. That's too geeky. We just had Thanos. How can you be too geeky? We have boom tubes. Like, we're, in our, we're enjoying a renaissance, a golden age. Uh, and I think the other thing that everyone wants to see is Daredevil um, in a movie. Uh, and we're all really sad that we didn't get him like on a screen sort of somewhere. Is there anyone else for you, Jason? Uh, I mean, I think Kamala Khan is a, I, I was not joking about that earlier. Like, I think she's a great choice. I actually, 
I, I've had a pitch for a very long time, and I'll never get to write it, so I'll just say it here, so I don't care. Um, it, I've, when they first announced Inhumans, I was so excited about that because I love the Inhumans. I love Jack Kirby. And to me, the perfect introduction for the Inhumans is to do the event that they did from Infinity where the Terrigen Mists explode across the Earth and we meet this 13-year-old girl who gets infected and she's suddenly an Inhuman and then, you know, she's just on the streets and she has stretchy powers and stuff like that. And then this ship drops drops down in front of her and it's Medusa being like, you're now a member of the Inhumans. Come with us to the strange city in the middle of India. And, sh- and she's just like, what? <laughs> I've never left the country. What? And, and it's this weird Game of Thrones alien. Like we get to be introduced to the world of the Inhumans through Kamala. I think that's a great, you know, and and of course, like it even works even better because then you can make Kamala as like a super fan of Captain Marvel, and then the in, the joke of the entire movie is that Medusa's like, you know, Captain Marvel is not an Inhuman, right? <laughs> right? You know, don't, don't you want to talk about Gorgon or Triton or you know Black Bolt? And she's like, nah, Captain Marvel, it's good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I think that's the perfect way to introduce some of those weird things. So speaking of weird things, uh, we have seen basically the ending of phase one or well i mean you know phase three but basically it's kind of the end of a big phase one for iron man and captain america and stuff like that uh ryan i'm gonna put you on the spot because you're holding the microphone of all of the og avengers Mm -hmm. or the avengers that the people that have been considered avengers up till this point till end game who would you want to be friends with (laughs) (laughs) who do you actually think you would actually honestly want to be friends with or who would be a good friend, who would be a terrible friend? Cap. It's hard, you know. Cap is such a, uh, <laughs> a true blue kind of dude, you know, uh, pun intended. Um, yeah, I think there would be no guesswork with Cap. You know, he's got your back. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think he was just such a, such a genuine, straightforward kind of guy. You know, it would be hard not to, not to like him. Now, I'm going to give you a devil's advocate for this. All right. Because we know Cap was born in 1918. <laughs> Do you, don't you think sometimes he would talk like your grandpa? <laughs> like, you'd be listening to some music and be like, hey, 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 turn that down. Turn that and, down. Let's that listen would, to some Bing Crosby. Yeah, that would, that would be fun. You know, he, he seemed like he could, he could take a joke, and, and he seemed like he was willing to learn. He'd just pull out his little pad and, <laughs> you know, be like, okay, well, what should I be listening to? What would you add to his list in terms of, like, pop culture or oh. things for him to check out? Because Star Wars is on there. I know you're a big Star Wars that, fan. That was the first one. <laughs> on <there>. um, <laughs> I would, uh, Batman v Superman. <laughs> <laughs> I was that's great. I, I was also gonna mention the the thing I love about that list is that if you look at that list, Star Wars and Star Trek is on that list. So Captain America is the great uniter in terms yeah. of nerds. I love that. Man. So he's uh he's by sci fi. He's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Ashley. Uh, yeah, it's hard not to say Cap. Uh, he seems great. Um, I really like Sam Wilson. I really love the MCU version of Falcon, and Anthony Mackie is so cool. I met him for like 10 minutes in real life, and he was really lovely. <laughs> so if he's anything like that, um, I think that would be really spectacular. And then I think it's also tough not to say Shuri, because Shuri has the best clothes, the best gadgets, and the best jokes so i would really like to be friends with shuri and steal her cute sailor moon haircuts i mean i just want to go on a a, like a bachelor weekend with thor and rocket (laughs) (laughs) i i mean i just i i want to be best friends with them i i want to go on adventures i want to go build weapons from dying stars i want to go steal guys' eyes i want to steal people's arms with rocket and thor and then I want to be an Asgardian of the galaxy, man, with all of them, because that that is that that dynamic. I keep going back to it, but that I want to be their friends. Do you think Rocket would have any patience for you, though? Because he has no patience for anyone. No, he wouldn't have patience. Or for you, would Rocket smell the dog on you and be like, "I'm in." He would <laughs> one or the other, but I think I think he would bring out probably a lot of my dark side. Um, like he's like, "We're gonna go over here and do that." And I'm like, "All right, dude, let's do it." Like I would, I would, I would definitely enable Rocket, and so I think he would he would get to know me and like me because of that. Uh, my choice, and I can't believe you guys missed the most obvious choice. 
Uh, my guy is a guy who became an Avenger in Endgame because once Cap said Avengers Assemble, everybody in that shot is an Avenger. Yeah. Um, Wong. Yeah. Wong is such a cool dude, man. He likes tuna melts. He listens to Beyonce. He reads. And then anytime you have a problem, like, like here's the thing. If you were friends with, with, with Stephen Strange, it would be a nightmare. Let's be honest with that. Like, you'd go to Stephen and be like, hey, Stephen, I need help on my taxes. What a taxes, And you'd be like, oh, God, shut up. Uh, but with Wong, he'd be like, yeah, come over here. And he'd shrink your accountant for you or shrink the IRS or, or like, give you gold bullion from the bottom of the ocean like he's that he's, he's legit he's a cool dude he should be the sorcerer supreme let's be honest with that i just want to point out that none of us said spider-man <laughs> which i think is the most obvious version the, like the easiest best friend um i would tell cap to put into the spider-verse on his list of things to check out same because it's my favorite marvel movie <laughs> <laughs> well let's 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 flip that then uh let's start with you mark who's the worst person who's the worst person who's the person that if you were having a house party, mm-hmm. you're having a house party. So or, or like, let's let's do this. You're having a, a geeky cocktail party. <laughs> I've had them. Yep, yep. Mark has. Have we been to them? They're great. <laughs> uh, but you're having a geeky cocktail party, and this person walks in the door, and you're like, oh god, no. An Avenger? Yes. One of the Avengers? Again, it could be anybody in that last shot because there's five thousand people yeah, right, in that right, shot, right. and they're now technically all Avengers. Oh, God, because I like them all. Um, no, this think. is the internet. <laughs> yeah. I probably, I, I probably wouldn't want Groot to come in because I have a dog and they like trees for reasons that aren't, you know. So probably Groot and just by default, you know. So Groot. I'm going to stay on the um, Guardians of the Galaxy side of things and I'll say Nebula. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I don't think she would grasp the fun concept so much. She likes to warm up to football, though. That was really cute, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it was also a little scary, you know. I didn't, <laughs> you know, yeah, really, really intense, you know. And I think she would freak everybody out. Um, but I want to make an uh, amendment to my last answer of hanging with uh, <laughs> hanging with Cap. <laughs> Once again, Guardians of the Galaxy. I think I could have a blast with Drax. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to imagine that. I think I could, and like I would just, you know, just think of stuff to just run by him and see what his reactions were, and (laughs) and make him think he's invisible and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I could have fun with Drax. So just to stay on the Guardians of the Galaxy trade for worst, um, part of this is because I despise this character and this character archetype. Um, part of it is because this person has problematic life things. Uh, screw Star Lord, like screw him entirely. I don't like him. Didn't like him every time he showed up in Endgame. So uh, he's the worst. <laughs> I I love how Ashley is just throwing grenades in front of our listeners. <laughs> You like this? Here's a grenade. You like this? There's a grenade. Look, the number one thing people hate me for is my feelings about Ant-Man, so I got nothing to lose at this point. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Um, see, this is, yeah, this is a harder answer for me because I think there are a lot of terrible people in this group. Uh, <laughs> I mean, think Any about it. too vague. I mean, I, mean I, I did mention Dr. Stephen Strange. Like, he would just be, well, one, he's a stuck-up surgeon. Right. So he is going to judge every piece of furniture in your house and tell you that it's not good enough. I mean, I love the movie. and I love that character, but he is walking white male privilege. (laughs) (laughs) But but even but even but even worse than that, Stephen Strange is going to walk into your party. He's going to eat your food. He's going to do a bunch of stuff. He's going to stay way too long because he's not going to take the hint. Because he's taking some sort of elixir, and you're going to be like, hey, Steven, we're wrapping up. He's like, yes, but now I have a conversation about the Rams. Yes, let's talk about the Rams. Like, do you even know what football is? No, I was actually talking about Rams, real Rams. Uh, And you're going to be like, get out of here. But then it gets even worse, because you're going to walk into your closet, and you're going to find that Stephen Strange has some sort of creature from inside his bag of the Hermione had in Harry Potter that is like the TARDIS. And it has crawled out of his bag while he was sitting on your couch, and it now lives in your closet. And it is impossible to get rid of. So you have to call Wong, who is the greatest friend of all time. Uh, but no, Stephen Strange is pretty bad. Um, I honestly think Scott Lang would not be a cool dude to be friends with. I think, I think Scott Lang would be the guy that would drink all your beer and then lie about it. 
<laughs> I honestly, let's. I mean, I mean, I like Scott Lang. He seems like a cool dude. But I even think that of Paul Rudd, and I, and I know Paul Rudd's a generally nice person. But I think Paul Rudd would come over to my house, drink all my beer, and then lie about it. <laughs> I mean, Paul, did you drink all this? No. <laughs> How much beer is in your fridge right now? I think there's like a six pack <laughs> left over from a party. I don't drink beer really, so <laughs> I was using a, a, a metaphor in a context, Ashley. Um, so let's talk about this. We have this giant Avengers huge battle that just happened at the end of Endgame. Is there any way they can top this? Let's be honest. How the hell can they top this battle? This battle is huge. It has, I, I called it bombastic earlier. There's so many characters. There's so many turns. There's so many twists. Let's on, actually be honest with this. We're all intelligent people on this stage. Or intelligent people in this, in this audience as well. Can they top it? Because I'm, I'm going to bring up an earlier point. We talked about Avengers 1. And that Avengers 1 knocked our socks off. We didn't see it coming. We never expected this. Avengers 2 comes out. Same director. Same writer. Same cast. Oh, okay. Will the next Avengers movie... Is it impossible for it, no matter what they give it, give us, is it impossible for it to beat Endgame? What do you guys think? Looking for anybody here. I mean, I mean, the answer is yes, but the advantage that the next Avengers movie has is please stop giving us four and three movies a year. Um, is it's a whole new cast. Like the idea of the new Avengers, you could have new characters that we're excited to see again. You could introduce new characters the way like Hawkeye was introduced in Avengers 1. Um, so you basically just have to go back to a standard origin story, which is something that Marvel does pretty well. And we might give them a pass just on that. But sometimes just because something goes well and the lightning strikes the first time doesn't mean you have to do it again. I would be fine if we put the name of the team and the concept of Avengers to bed and explore different like Marvel teams. Like maybe we do Jason's favorite, the Thunderbolts, or we do, or we do yeah. something, you know, with the future foundation, we do something else because the next Avengers movie has a lot resting on it. Yeah. I think, you know, it's tough because we're, if we're, we're sitting here having seen it in the past week and like, you know, like nothing's ever going to beat that. It was so awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when it all settles, it's like, what Marvel does well, uh, and, and thanks to Kevin Feige and the people he works with, I think that it will be topped if, you know, if they pay attention to the characters and, mm -hmm. and make it as emotional as they did this. I mean, because you can do a lot of effects and they will fall flat on the ground if you don't care about the characters. And what they've done throughout 22 movies is make you care. So as long as they go to a new Avengers or Thunderbolts or bring in Sentry or... Name or whoever, make me care about the characters. Give me a new exciting set piece, and um, it'll be topped because we'll care and and we'll go whoa because of, we didn't think about this and in that. And so I, I think sooner or later we'll get there. Ryan, what do you feel? I agree with Mark one hundred percent. The first thing I, I thought about, you know, was thinking what what could be that big of a threat, right? And so Galactus. I went to Galactus. Right. I went to Galactus, but Or Doctor Doom. You know. Yeah, with, bah. with Well, then I yeah, a million Doom bots. Um but I mean you we haven't lived until you've seen the cameo turn from Doom Bot number seven, I'm telling you. Oh, he man. is a secret star. You will not believe it. I thought it was number eight. Oh yeah, I mean you're right. Sorry. Okay. I'm All sorry. Right. All right. I'm let's, sorry. Let's, yeah, let's yeah, number it. seven kind of phones it in sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that that, you know, uh, a Galactus fight could be as dynamic as what we saw, you know, because there was just so much. But with what Mark was saying, there was the there was the buildup. Like we cared, so we knew the threat of the Chitari. When when we saw uh, Space Slug Number Three, <laughs> we knew what it was capable of. We knew the history. We knew, oh wow, Thor's got two hammers now, you know, and, and, and what it took, the, the journey that it, it took for him to get Stormbreaker and what Mjolnir meant to him, um, what it meant. It was like all of those moments, what it meant for Cap who budged the hammer in Age of Ultron to, to pick it up and, and to now have the power of, of Thor, you know, um, uh, as a result of the hammer. Um, 
uh, Spider-Man, the, the instant kill mode for the, the suit, because we, we gone on those individual journeys with these characters, all of those moments really meant so much. So it wasn't necessarily just the side, I mean, uh, just, just the, the, the VFX spectacle of it all, but it was just like all of those little moments that meant something that, that added to it, that, that made it what it was. So I feel like it, it could be, um, it's, it's definitely possible. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I don't think that it could come right away. It's going to have to be that, that build up so we can get those moments um, to, to be a part of it. Oh, I agree. And I think if anybody can pull it off, I think it's Marvel. Um, you know, I think it's always interesting to look at the opposite side of things because, like, again, as right now, we're riding that high of Endgame. We're like, oh, my God, man, it's amazing, best movie ever. But I agree with you. Like, if they take their time, save, like, whatever the next cosmic key, as Guardians of the Galaxy, I hope they call it that. Um, if that's the next one and we hear, like, oh, there's some, this planet that was there, it's gone. Oh, that's weird. Okay, cool. And then Captain Marvel 2. Hey, let's go to the Scroll homeworld. Oh, it's gone? Oh, where'd it go? Weird. All right, cool. And then like you get to start I, I like I'm I'm crossing my fingers right now. You know, I haven't of course at the time of this recording have not seen Spider Man from from home, have no idea about it. But I'm really hoping that they drop a line in there that were like, Oh man, we tried to go see the museums of Latveria, but the borders were closed. Just like one like and yeah. start laying in Doctor Doom here and there. Like I hope in like Black Panther uh, uh two like we go to the UN and they meet some like vaguely uh, European guy. It could be Doug. Uh, and Doug is like, oh, I missed, uh, I, I've taken the job from Latveria. Hello, my boss, uh, Victor. You know, like just like little things like that. If they, if, they, if they layer them in, yeah, by the time we get there, it will seem as big as in-game or even bigger. So, yeah. It's also funny. We keep sort of circling the drain on the Fantastic Four discussion. And every time since the original Avengers movie that a new Avengers movie comes up, there's the rumor that the Silver Surfer is in it. And that's how the Fantastic Four is going to be introduced. So I think it's interesting that with Galactus as the next obvious step up, like it's either got to be Galactus, I guess, or the Beyonder. Mm -hmm. um, you, it's, you feel like you need the FF for that. And they ruined it by casting Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange <laughs> and not being Reed Richards. <laughs> All right. So final thing here. I'm going to make you put on your creative hats. And I want you, you cannot use New Avengers. You cannot use that title. I want to hear a pitch for what we think the next Avengers movie could be called. You cannot use New Avengers. So, because uh, obviously that's the obvious choice. Like we all, like, it's pretty obvious. It's probably going to be New Avengers. But if you had to name it Avengers movie, Avengers blankety blankety blank. Because it's fun. Fun fact: nobody was right on Endgame. Everybody had that wrong. Like I had so much money that it was going to be Avengers Forever, because Avengers Forever is one of the best Avengers comic book storylines of all time, written by if you've listened to the podcast, uh, Kurt Busiek, one of my favorite writers. Uh, I thought they were going to call it Avengers Forever. Take that title back from Batman. Don't let Batman ruin the forever subtitle. Take it back, Avengers. Um, so that is my pick for a new, because they haven't used it yet, that I hope they call a movie Avengers Forever. Or I'm even going to do this. There's another famous storyline with a great subtitle, Avengers Under Siege. And that's where the masters of evil invade the Avengers Mansion and beat the crap out of Jarvis. Now, of course, James Darcy is uh, not our live-action Jarvis in the current uh, storyline, so we couldn't do that. We'll have to find some new butler to uh, punish in that movie. Uh, if anybody, Ashley, do you have a, you have a go on an Avenger subtitle? I would probably call it a title that I know a bunch of people wanted uh, to be a movie title, and we recently learned it's not going to be. I would call it uh, Avengers Balance of the Force. <laughs> that's what i would call it um you know i don't know it's really it's tough because we get it in our head like i thought the last one was going to be called infinity gauntlet because of the dual meanings of gauntlet um but i think that is maybe too clever that title actually still would have worked for that movie sure i mean any title would have worked for that movie. Honestly, like Endgame is nice from that meta narrative perspective of like, yes, we are aware that this is the last one with everyone who didn't re-up their contracts. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. You want to know why people died? They didn't sign a new contract. Uh, that's just the, you know, facts are facts, America. <laughs> but I like it when they pull from comics. So I think Secret Wars is a great title, even if we didn't get the classic Secret Wars story. Mm -hmm. 
Ryan or Mark? Just top of your head. Let's go. Don't put much thought into this. All right. I'm a Hollywood executive, and I'm ready to give you millions of dollars. All, All right. right. Have I got the story okay, for you? Okay, let's hear it. I'd call it Avengers New Order. And Ooh. it would be, uh, you know, getting the new order of Avengers. But I'd also do a, a double thing here, and I'd introduce the mutants into the MCU uh, through it, whether it's a post credit scene or something that kind of hints at uh, their existence. Nice. All right, Ryan, we have a million-dollar check with your name on it. What's your Avengers subtitle? Uh, nothing overly imaginative. Um, I, would, I would think new Avengers. I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, nod to the to the comic and it and again you know we saw the end game we saw this our you know current version of the avengers um is is no more so i think this is a perfect introduction um and we could include mutants now um we could grab the century um west coast avengers jason i Really hope West Coast Avengers, <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Actually, they should take that title. They really should. Actually, I think that would be a great like Hulu title. I have another pitch for you for an Avengers title. Uh, what do you think about Avengers, Jeffrey Wilder's a coming? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't he, Jason. shouldn't he be a leader of the Thunderbolts? <laughs> Uh, yeah, you are you are we gonna pitch that right now? Let's pitch it. Let me make some calls, man. Uh, yeah, he could take the Norman Osborne role I and he could I assemble a team. I could, I could yeah. see that. We yeah. want EP credit, right? <laughs> <laughs> we want back end points on every Mar- Marvel movie you're in. Yeah, my I'll probably get the Great Lakes Avengers. You know, great. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, to be honest with you, I'm surprised with four Avengers movies, we actually haven't gotten a Great Lakes Avengers qu- uh, a joke. Like, mm-hmm. it's their terrible fan club in the Midwest, the Great Lakes Avengers. Right, right. And, like, it's just some joke of, like, Tony's like, I keep getting letters from these Great Lakes Avengers. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, anytime Marvel wants to do Avengers colon Alpha Flight, they can call me to consult. <laughs> Everyone can have a funny accent. It'll all be north of the border. We'll get a great tax credit if we shoot in Vancouver. And we'll scoop up everyone who's ever been on Arrow. It'll be fine. <laughs> well, I think that is a perfect way to end the Analyzing the Avengers. Uh, real quick, I want to give a shout out to the amazing Ryan Sands from Runaways for joining us here. Please give him a round of applause. Thanks for having me. And I want to give a major shout out to Mark Riley, host of the Riley Roundtable, available on iTunes for joining us as well. Thank Thank you, Mark, for joining us. Pleasure being here. Thanks. And guys, thank you so much for coming to our first live show. We're going to be out in the hallway for some meet and greets. We can take a picture with you guys. We want to talk with you guys. You can get a picture with uh, uh, Mark and Ryan, hopefully. Uh, uh, they charge more than we do. So uh, just, you know, be pre prepared. Have your credit cards ready. And uh, we have t shirts for sale out there, but like, please join us out in the hall. We want to talk to you more. Thank you so much for coming to our first Geek Us Wrestling Live. It means so much to us. Uh, I have been Jason Wong is the best Inman. I have been Ashley Victoria Robinson. And Professor Ashley, why don't you close out our first live show? Uh, Class is dismissed.